Welcome back to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal. Very pleased to be joined again by my friend Paul Cantor, professor, professor of literature at the University of Virginia, the, who's been a guest on many conversations ranging from and topics from Shakespeare to popular culture to fiction to the Western in movies and, and novels. But uh, today we're going to talk about Shakespeare and comedy. You, I should, before we get into that, I should say that you can watch a whole series of lectures by Paul, excellent lectures on Shakespeare uh, at the Shakespeare and politics page of Great Thinkers, thegreatthinkers.org. So go to thegreatthinkers.org, click on Shakespeare and politics, and you get a very well curated page with Paul's lectures and actually the earlier conversations we've had on Shakespeare, et cetera. But enough of the promotion, let's get to, to the topic. So th Paul, thanks for, thanks for being with me. Pleasure being here. And, no, it's uh, virtual. Yeah, I know. Next time. Next time. Uh, yeah, I in think so. Next time in reality. But so Shakespeare and comedy. So you wanted to talk about comedy. It's it's uh, most people, you know, Shakespeare, the tragedies come to mind first and they're more serious and heavy and weighty and all that. I assume you have a slightly different view if you want to discuss uh, comedy here. Yeah, I think comedy doesn't get enough attention. And I recognize that. Shakespeare's tragedies are very great plays. I'd say that King Lear and Hamlet are his two greatest works. But I think we tend to underestimate the comedies because we don't understand, paradoxically, their seriousness. Uh, and there's a way in which the comedies uh, take up subjects uh, seriously in a way that maybe the tragedies don't. Uh, and so I've always felt that we the, the comedies tend to be neglected uh, or discussed in superficial ways. It's well known that you can't explain humor. There's nothing worse than trying to analyze a joke. Uh, and so I, I think it's pretty clear that the scholarship on the tragedies is more interesting than that on the comedies. But I do think that there, uh, there's something to be learned from the comedies that we can't learn from the tragedies. And here I take my clue from Leo Strauss. Uh, uh, also, was, also the subject of several conversations on this yeah. in this series with uh, Harvey Mansfield and others. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, that is uh, one of the few literary critics who has taken Strauss as a liter literary critic seriously, and I found that he has uh, many profound comments about comedy. Uh, as always with Strauss, they're somewhat enigmatic, but I've tried to learn from them. But I'll say my whole attitude towards Shakespearean comedy was altered uh, when I was uh, reading uh, Strauss's book, City on Man, uh, when it first came out. Indeed, I was enrolled in a course with Harvey Mansfield at the mm -hmm. time, as I recall. Uh, I was trying to learn how to read literature based on the way Strauss read philosophy. In any case, in his essay on Plato's Republic, uh, he's talking about uh, the Republic uh, and uh, comparing it to a work by uh, Thomas More. And he, he, he writes, the relation of weeping and laughing is similar to that of tragedy and comedy. We may therefore say that the Socratic conversation and hence the Platonic dialogue is slightly more akin to comedy than to tragedy. This kinship is notable, noticeable also in Plato's Republic, which is manifestly akin to Aristophanes' Assembly of Women. Uh, now that sentence really shocked me that the platonic dialogue is slightly more akin to comedy than to tragedy. Uh, in a way, Strauss is saying that comedy is more philosophic uh, than tragedy. And it's taken me a long time to understand that sentence. It often happens with sentences from Leo Strauss, uh, but I now agree with it. Uh, and what I gradually came to understand uh, is that comedy is skeptical. Uh, comedy raises doubts about things. You can even go right to Aristotle and the discussion of tragedy and comedy and the, po and the poetics, where Aristotle says, tragedy presents men better than they are, and comedy presents men worse than they are. Uh, and in a way, Aristotle is pointing to the same idea here. You could put it this way, that Tragedy takes the heroes of the city seriously. Uh, it looks up to them. It presents them as heroic. Uh, it shows them as problematic, 
because after all, their outcome is tragic, right. but they are still heroic uh, in their tragedies and in that sense, admirable. Uh, and you can see it in the way people do admire uh, the great heroes of tragedy. Uh, whereas comedy, uh, and Aristotle says this, it, it reveals the laughable, and it makes us laugh at people. In fact, our Aristotle's account is that tragedy arises from the encomia, uh, the hymns of praise that people used to write to heroes, and uh, comedy arises from lampoons, uh, from satires of people. And uh, that satiric spirit of uh, comedy means that it cuts people down a peg or two. It, for example, shows that the heroes of cities uh, have feet, feet of clay. Uh, and so in that, that's the way I think Strauss means that comedy is more philosophical, uh, that Tragedy, in a way, accepts uh, the beliefs of the city. It, for example, accepts the gods uh, because violating divine statutes is what gets you in trouble uh, in a tragedy. Uh, whereas comedy really laughs at everything in the city, including its heroes and even its gods. Aristophanes' comedy of the birds is a great example of that when you realize that even comedies were presented in a kind of religious festival in Athens, it's just astounding that the birds was produced at a religious festival. Uh, it makes fun of heroes like Hercules. It shows them to be a real dumb dolt. And even the gods are shown uh, as weak. They're, they're starved in submission by the birds when the birds decide to interdict uh, sacrifices going up to the gods. They starve the gods into submission by preventing the sacrifices from rising uh, from the earth into the heavens. It's just an astounding play when you think of it that way. And uh, in, in a sense, Strauss's point is that comedy is more subversive than tragedy. Tragedy, in a way, stands behind the city and its heroes and its gods and its way of life, and it deals with the heroic, and it suggests these heroic figures are genuinely heroic, whereas Aristophanes presents them as boasters, uh, as men who only uh, pretend to be heroic and who turn out indeed to be perfectly ordinary. Uh, and once I realized that, I said, well, you know, there's, there's something to be said for philosophy uh, being closer to comedy because comedy shares the philosophical doubt, the doubt that's at the basis of philosophy. I suppose Strauss in, did indeed what he says in speech in the sense that he wrote a book, Socrates and Aristophanes. I think it's the only long treatment of his, really long, sustained of a, let's call it a poet or a playwright. I suppose. I mean, he deals with them in passing at other times and he knew quite a lot actually about a lot of them, it seems like, but had studied them, but... Uh, so he, there's a kind of kinship of Socrates and Aristophanes that perhaps there wouldn't be of Socrates and, and the tragic uh, poets. And, and so that's out of Plato of Ar and Aristophanes, therefore, presumably. So, yeah, but I guess comedy is both more philosophic than tragedy and philosophy maybe is more, more comic than, than tragic, right? I mean, that's... The, uh, ultimately, the... the which is uh, a contrarian point because, you know, everyone, the normal so account of Socrates is the apology, the tragedy, yeah. he's killed by the city, and somehow yeah. that's not the deepest side, maybe. Yeah. Well, uh, Plato turns that Socratic tragedy into a comedy hmm. because it ends happily. Uh, because Socrates, on the yeah. basis of philosophy, says, I don't fear death. Uh, if the accounts of it are true, and I'm going to meet up uh, with the great poets in the afterlife, then it's fine. If not, it's just uh, I'll be asleep. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really is a point that I, a number of people have noted, independent of Strauss, that, <clears throat> and and by the way, that uh, that passage I read is right after an account uh, from Thomas More saying that uh, we have examples of Jesus weeping, but we have no examples of him laughing, whereas of Socrates, we have no examples of him weeping yeah, uh, and only examples of him laughing. And so that's so interesting. Yeah, isn't that yeah. amazing? Yeah. yeah. But anyway, Strauss discussed Aristophanes, but not Shakespeare much. And so he left it to you to do Shakespeare's comedies. That was nice. That was, that was, that was nice of him to leave you some work to do there. You know? Yes. I have to say that uh, 
when Strauss comments on Shakespeare, it's always pretty much right on and shows that he knew what he was doing uh, there. Uh, but I was thrilled when the Aristophanes book came out. And indeed, I may read some passages from it because it, it, it has even more interesting passages uh, uh, scattered uh, uh, in it uh, about comedy. Uh, and indeed, I do think that Shakespearean comedy is different from Aristophantic mm. uh, comedy. Uh, in, in a way, it seems uh, less serious at first. Uh, Aristophantic comedy, it, it was what was called old comedy uh, among the ancient Greeks, and it dealt with politics. Uh, and you see so many of uh, yeah. Aristophanes' plays are making fun of Athenian politicians, Creon, uh, for example. And, and on the surface of it, uh, uh, Aristophantic comedy uh, seems to deal with more serious issues. Uh, uh, what replaced Aristophanes <coughs> among the ancient Greeks was what was called new comedy. Uh, chief representative of that is Menander. We have a slight problem with Menander that only one of his plays has survived whole and a substantial fragment of another one. Uh, but uh, Menander's comedy is already recognizably Shakespeare's comedy. Shakespeare did write new comedy, and that is uh, Menander's comedy was about young lovers uh, and how they got in trouble with their parents and how their parents tried to prevent them from getting married and then how were they... Uh, 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 the help of a wily slave, they outwitted their parents. Uh, now, uh, Greek new comedy became Roman comedy, uh, chiefly Plautus and Terence, uh, and that's where Shakespeare inherited his tradition of comedy from. Uh, there were some uh, English comedies he worked from, but Shakespeare's evidently his first play and his first comedy was the Comedy of Errors, and that's based on a play by Plautus. Uh, so it, it's not clear that Shakespeare ever saw, uh, ever read a Greek a Greek hmm. tragedy or comedy. That's uh, interesting, yeah. Uh, they were barely available in Greek at that point, uh, and that was in Italy. Uh, there, there are just, there's just the fewest signs uh, the phrase when the hurly burly is done in Macbeth, hurly burly is used in the first English translation uh, of Seneca's line of Agamemnon. <laughs> I think that's the only smoking god we've got that Shakespeare had ever seen, uh, even a, a, a Roman tragedy. Anyway, uh, uh, but Shakespeare's comedy deals with romance. Yeah, so romance let's talk and, about what yeah. two or three, I mean, what, you know, let's give, give people some help here and which comedies uh, would you say are, I don't know, bring out your point most easily okay. or clearly in, uh, in Shakespeare's. I should report. say that as I, I check this, every one of Shakespeare's comedies deals with romantic love. Hmm. So it was a subject of great interest to him. Uh, and let me talk about that first before talking about specific uh, comedies. Uh, that is, we're talking about comedy as a corrective. Uh, that people have illusions, they overestimate things, uh, uh, and so the comic poet comes in to correct them. And I think of all Shakespeare's comedies, uh, Much Ado About Nothing is the most aptly title. Uh, sounds like the Seinfeld of the Renaissance, uh, <laughs> the play about nothing. Uh, but in a way, that is the formula for Shakespearean comedy, Much Ado About Nothing. He looks around the world and he sees people taking stuff really, really seriously. And his answer is that's a mistake, uh, that you're taking something seriously that does not deserve to be taken seriously. You're making much ado about nothing. And as that play shows, and as all the comedies do, Shakespeare uh, believed that people were taking love too seriously. Uh, now, this sounds odd for one of the great love poets of right. all time. Uh, and indeed, uh, Romeo and Juliet can help understand this. Uh, Romeo and Juliet easily could have become uh, a Menander-type comedy. Uh, it is a play of young lovers trying out with parents and uh, people pointing out, uh, well, into the third act. 
act up until the point where Mercutio was killed. Uh, Romeo and Juliet could still have a comic ending. Uh, uh, but Shakespeare does give the story a tragic ending. And he's raising doubts about the kind of love uh, that uh, is represented uh, by Romeo and Juliet. Uh, his problem with that kind of love is it's suicidal. And it's not accidentally suicidal, as Shakespeare presents it. Uh, yeah, a lot of things happen. Uh, there are uh, misplaced letters. Uh, all sorts of people show up a minute too late to the tomb and so on. But the problem with these two kids, according to Shakespeare, is they want to die for each other. They have a conception of love uh, in which you only prove the depth of your love. The, uh, you only prove your love is infinite by making the ultimate and infinite sacrifice for love. Namely, uh, I would die for you. And indeed, Shakespeare brilliantly contrives the plot so that uh, uh, Romeo gets to commit suicide, thinking Juliet's dead, and then when she revives and sees he's dead, she commits suicide. Uh, and the problem is suicide is too easily triggered uh, when your conception of love is that it's something infinite. Uh, uh, and how can you measure the infinite only with the whole uh, of your life? And I think Shakespeare was trying to show in that play the tragedy of this conception of love. We'll talk about its nature in a minute, uh, but it was the prevalent conception of love in all the poetry and literature uh, of the, the Renaissance. Uh, and it's so self-destructive. Uh, that it's like these kids, they, they just give me any excuse to kill myself because I got something to prove. I want it does to seem prove. also that uh, if you think of the comedies, in addition to the critique of love, which we'll get back to in a minute uh, and, and that tradition, Comedy of Errors is a funny title, obviously, in a way. And they all seem to be, there are a lot of errors in these comedies. People make stupid mistakes. They misinterpret what other people are saying. They get misled by other by either their fellow lover or by their parents or their parents make a mistake about the kids. And it's uh, a lot of the working out of the plots has to do with these, you know, overcoming these errors, right. That people yeah, somehow but, make. But Shakespeare's point is it seems always accidental right. and to be the product of certain errors, but not everybody automatically reacts by seeing the corpse of a beloved by killing yourself. Yeah, yeah. Now, what Shakespeare is showing... Life is full it, of errors, but you don't need to go... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It's like they're looking for disaster. Uh, and that's the whole tradition of love poetry that he had inherited, uh, going all the way back to the Italians, as we'll see. Uh, but that's his point uh, that I think he observed that there was a kind of death wish uh, in this notion of an infinite love. Uh, and it, it, uh, uh, again, you see it so perfectly uh, in Romeo and Juliet. I mean, R Romeo is ready to kill himself over Rosalind at the beginning of the play. It's like he's looking for something to die for, as happens so often in his plays. Uh, and I think Shakespeare realized that uh, tragedy may not be the best way to deal with the danger of this kind of love. Because the sad thing is, uh, young lovers see Romeo and Juliet, and this is true to this day, and they want to be like Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. That's what love is. Oh, he was willing to die for her. Oh, she was willing to die uh, uh, for him. Uh, they see what's heroic about it. They don't see what's stupid about it. Uh, and there are many characters in the play, most famously the nerd Juliet nurse, who do see what's so stupid about this, uh, what it looks like uh, 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 Romeo has been banished. Juliet nurse says, well, why not marry the county Paris? He's, mm -hmm. he's fine. He's good looking. When, you know, and, uh, no, no, she can't do that. Uh, mm -hmm. As we'll talk about uh, tragedies, the world of accept no substitutes. There's only one man for you in the whole world. So anyway, uh, it is funny that I think Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet as a cautionary tale about this kind of love. And look, it has survived to this day as the great banner 
for this infinite romantic love. And to this day, uh, uh, it's seductive uh, that young people see it. They want to be like Romeo and Juliet. They don't come away saying, gee, we really should listen to our parents. It's right. a much more practical thing to do. We um, don't trust some friar who tells you he has everything worked out. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think Shakespeare realized that comedy would be a better weapon against this notion of love, uh, that what it needs is to be ridiculed. Uh, and this is Shakespeare's point. This is really a stupid approach to life, uh, to think that what should be the guiding principle of your life is death, that it should be death devoted. Uh, and you know uh, you know this from Wagner's Tristan or Isolde, the whole German tradition in Romanticism, the death devotion of the romantic lovers. That goes all the way back uh, to Petrarch, as I'll talk about in, in a minute, and to Dante. And, uh, and uh, 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 Shakespeare thought, we got to make fun of this. We got to show it's laughable. And indeed, it would be in the tradition uh, broadly speaking, of Aristophantic comedy in this sense, you would show that these lovers have pretend pretensions. They actually think they're heroes. Uh, they think there's something heroic about something that when all is said and done is hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Much Ado About Nothing. Now, the, the title of Much Ado About Nothing is actually very clever. Uh, nothing was Elizabethan slang for the female organ. The idea is that men have a thing and women have nothing between their legs. Now, don't blame me for this. Uh, this is Elizabeth slide here. Uh, I'm not endorsing it, uh, but uh, uh, it's really funny because what much ado about nothing means is much ado about sex, much ado about the female organ. And in a way, it is Shakespeare's view of romantic love, that it presents itself as so spiritual uh, and leading to the infinite, but really it's just sex. And it's what he's trying to remind us of in his romantic comedies, that what gets turned into this ultimate spirituality really is a product of the body, of hormones, of sexual desire. That, uh, And it, it's, of course, it's a perfect choice for comedy there's nothing that brings out the silliness and stupid stupidity of human beings more than love. I mean, let's face it, the stupidest things people do in their lives are because of love. Now, I know it's a wonderful political emotion is the basis of our civilization and all of that. But let's face it, it also leads people to do incredibly stupid things. And that looks stupid to anyone who's not in the grip of the hormones. Uh, and I think one of the great themes of Shakespearean comedy, and it is romantic comedy, is the disproportion between the emotions the two lovers feel and anything that the outside observers think about it. And that's often the texture of these romantic comedies. Uh, and again, you see it beginning in Romeo and Juliet with Romeo explaining to the friar uh, how wonderful Rosalind is. And then he has to come back two scenes later and now say how wonderful Juliet is. And the friar says, wait a minute, weren't you just saying that about Rosalind? Uh, and Shakespeare's very good at setting up. Uh, it's very dramatic. This disproportion between what the lovers feel uh, and what any normal person society feels looking at this. So I think Shakespeare had the sense that what this view of love needed was ridicule. But after the debunking, I mean, he, which a lot of people could do after all, just be cynical and yeah, say this yeah. is ludicrous. And other people have said this throughout history. Um, there's also these plots that tend to result in sort of happy endings or seemingly Absolutely. happy endings and marriages <laughs> and so forth. Um, so, I mean, he wants yes. to also yes, not simply is, debunk, right? Yes, I mean, this is the great uh, enterprise of Shakespeare's romantic uh, uh, comedies to distinguish what is natural in love from what is conventional. Uh, and this is another way uh, in which I think Strauss understood comedy to be more philosophical. That tragedy is often concerned with one convention against another. 
antiquity, the law of the city against the law of the family. They're both conventions. Uh, and in a way, that's why tragedy cannot be resolved. Uh, but in the case of love, Shakespeare does see uh, an uh, underlying nature here. Uh, the character Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing is so perfect here. He says uh, uh, he's so skeptical about marriage. And, he's wondering about, and then he says at one point, the world must be peopled. <laughs> and that's the ultimate natural aim of love, as Shakespeare understands it. It's generation. Uh, and we we need to regenerate the human race uh, every generation uh, through sex. Uh, and but don't we also need, for the sake of the city and for society, families and some yes, structures? Yes, and yes, can't just and be, it can't just be that, sex. And yeah. that's really right. And that's the whole point that Shakespeare sees. Uh, a tremendous disjunction here. And again, I'll have to go back and give you the background on the notions of love in his day. But on the one hand, you have, would have a notion uh, that love is just sex, uh, that it's just indulging in pleasure, and it has no larger function whatsoever. Uh, and then you have this other view. Uh, and again, if love were just sex, you would be marriage. Uh, marriage is for the sake of families. On the other hand, you have this extreme view, which is, he would associate with the Italian poet Petrarch, uh, where love is so spiritual, uh, it's not a physical thing. It's above generation. Uh, uh, you have the idea that love, in fact, is incompatible with marriage, uh, uh, that, that marriage... Uh, domesticates love, it turns it into something ordinary and no longer infinite. And that's the thing you, you see, Romeo and Juliet despise uh, their parents' desire to get them well married, mm. uh, to offer marriage as a way of integrating them into society. No, in a way, their whole goal in love is to take themselves out of society and to reject their parents, to reject the city of Verona. Uh, it's interesting that they are accompanied in this project by a very subversive Catholic priest uh, in that city from, from Friar Lawrence. Uh, so uh, uh, Shakespeare's notion was to, this is so true to Shakespeare in so many ways, to achieve some kind of happy medium. And his answer was uh, that uh, love's ultimate social function is to produce children through families, and therefore love must be disciplined by marriage. And so, Bill, you're exactly right that Shakespeare's comedy is end with marriage. Uh, now, uh, that obviously is itself a social institution, but more importantly, uh, and you always see this at the end of Shakespearean uh, comedies, that marriage is an integrating institution. Uh, it brings together people. It brings together a whole community uh, around the marriage. And indeed, marriage becomes a fundamental social and socializing institution uh, in, in Shakespeare's comedies. So what he objected to was a notion of love uh, uh, that, again, sees love as infinite, and that means love is not compatible with finite things like marriage, having a family. Uh, again, it's, you can't picture Romeo and Juliet getting into a station wagon and taking the kids to a PTA meeting uh, on pa parents' night. Uh, uh, that would make them so petty in a way and no longer heroically. Uh, in a way, they seek out death to maintain the infinite purity of their love. They are so death devoted. I mean, they, they're invoking death in their speeches. Uh, and again, this survives all the way into Tristan and his old look. That seems to be uh, maybe a religious or Christian inflected kind of Love yes. or a particular characteristic, maybe, of a Christian yes, age. And that's, and, yes, and that's what Shakespeare was dealing with, uh, a notion of love that he uh, and his whole culture inherited uh, from the Middle Ages. So let me say something about that, because yeah. I think that really is the background to all of this. Now, there are various names for this kind of love. I've been uh, invoking Petrarch, the Italian poet who first wrote sonnets about love and obviously was very important uh, to uh, 
Shakespeare and the English poets in that sense. Uh, but it really goes back, this notion of love, to the troubadours uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, it's odd because uh, we're so used to this kind of love uh, that we don't realize it had a very specific origin. And it's within Western culture. We're talking about uh, the uh, uh, late 12th century uh, in Southern France, in the area we now call Provence. This is often called courtly love uh, uh, because it's associated with these small court. You know, there was no France in the 12th century. There were, uh, fr France was a dream of a couple of people living on a little island in the middle of the Seine River there. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 you had all these small courts uh, and they each had a poet in Again, that's where we uh, are, we're a troubadour. And it celebrated a, a special kind of love uh, in which uh, typically the, it would be a knight. Uh, these are often stories of knights in shining armor, as we'll see, you know, the story of Lancelot and Guinevere in the King Arthur cycle is a perfect example. Of this. A knight would be in love with a mistress, from a, a lady. He worships her from afar. Very often uh, he's blocked even from approaching her because she's the wife of his king. Now, again, uh, uh, the Lancelot, Guinevere, King Arthur triangle is uh, the an early example of this. Again, if you, I like to bring in Wagner all the time with this. It's also the story of Tristan Isolde and King Mark, uh, which is, by the way, a story that has its origins uh, in, in, in the Middle Ages uh, as, as well. Uh, and uh, the key thing to this notion of love is that it involves suffering. Uh, that's so distinctive about it. Uh, the idea is that it ain't love if you're not suffering. Now, there's a certain truth to that, and we've all suffered the pangs of love, uh, and we know how much suffering uh, can be involved in it. Uh, uh, but uh, for most of human history, that was regarded as a disadvantage of love. It was the downside of love. In the ancient world, for example, this kind of love was literally regarded as pathological, uh, that it was something to be gotten rid of. It was something to be, got, uh, to be cured. Uh, that unconsummated love, for example, in the ancient pagan world is regarded as one of the nasty experiences uh, in life. And so you have, for example, uh, Latin poet Ovid uh, wrote a book of poems called Remedies of Love. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, there were all these medical treatises in the ancient world that treated uh, uh, how do you deal with the pain of love. Again, it was thought to be something to be gotten rid of and to be overcome. Uh, that's really at the heart of the pagan notion of love, which is that love is sex and it's a good thing and you indulge in it. Uh, now what's really curious uh, and in a way appropriate that in the high middle ages, uh, you develop a conception of love where what marks the love as special is suffering. And uh, these, these poets, you got to say, uh, indulge themselves and portray the suffering of love. They wallow in the suffering. Uh, they create characters who go on and on and on about pain, how painful their love is. And you can see how this is the product of a Christian civilization uh, where, for example, asceticism has become a value in Christianity, that renouncing of pleasure, you know, wearing hair shirts, uh, imposing penances on yourself. These are thought of as goals of, of, of Christians. And uh, what developed was a kind of uh, parallel culture with this courtly love culture, uh, which gave this strange Christian inflection to love, uh, where what you wanted to do uh, in love was to suffer for it. So you sought out an impossible situation, fall in love with a woman uh, uh, that you can't possibly marry. Uh, it's very interesting that it, there, there's a book by a, 
a man we know as Andreas Kapalanis, uh, it's often called in English, The Art of Courtly Love. Uh, its real title is more like The Art of Loving Nobly. And one of the sections, it, it's actually it's so funny, it's a medieval treatise, so it reads a bit like uh, Thomas Aquinas's Summa. It poses questions and then answers them. And one of the questions is love compatible with marriage? And the answer is a resounding no. Mm. Uh, uh, and it, uh, marriage was seen as the ordinary world. Uh, you wanted to renounce this. Now, by the way, there's a brilliant and incredibly controversial book on the subject uh, by Denis de Rougemont called in English, Love in the West World. And he associates this development with a Gnostic outbreak in Southern France at the same time, the civilization of the so-called Cathars, uh, C-A-T-H-A-R-S, uh, that uh, this was a Gnostic community uh, that developed in Provence, again, around the 12th century, uh, uh, these are the people who were wiped out by the Albigensian crusade. Uh, and, and so we're kind of uh, 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 straying into uh, religious mysticism here, but it's very interesting that he shows that the way these troubadour poets address their mistress is just the way the Cathar poets addressed their distant, obscured God. Uh, God was seen as unreachable in Gnostic fashion. Anyway, I just mentioned if anyone wants to read some more background on this, uh, it is absolutely fascinating what de uh, uh argues uh, uh, in this book. And again, it shows this was uh, not a mainstream movement. Uh, it was seen as heretical. Uh, and indeed, the Pope and the uh, King of France got together uh, to wipe out this culture. Uh, 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 but the tradition it, of courtly love lives on. I mean, despite lives that. on, and it, it is amazing how quickly it conquered Europe. Uh, uh, there was no internet then, but within fifty years, uh, this mode of poetry had spread as far as modern Yugoslavia. There are Croatian poets who write in this style. And it is what we recognize to be love poetry. It's these poets who introduce the language of religion into love. Mm -hmm. And our love poetry is saturated uh, with uh, the language of religion. Uh, the lover and his beloved are trying to get to heaven through their love. If you betray your beloved, you are a heretic. Uh, and indeed, there's a great deal of language of heresy and of conversion. Uh, and this surfaces throughout Shakespeare's uh, comedies as well. And again, we are so used to this. We think it's normal to speak of love as a religious experience. But this is the first time it ever happens anywhere in the world. And again, we can't believe that. We, we imagine, well, didn't Greek poets talk about uh, love as heaven? No. Latin poets, they talked about it as a sickness. So Shakespeare's dealing with this particular phenomenon, but yeah. also it's a more human. I mean, it still has a sort of grounding in human nature that he's also interested in dealing well, with. Well, right? really, what's, what's really interesting, what made this popular, and in a certain sense made it great, is it introduced a new spiritual dimension, uh, not just into the speaking about love, but into love itself. And I think, you know, it, it's all very uh, well to idealize uh, the pagan world and pagan sex. Must have been a lot of fun, but it kind of demeaned it as an experience. Uh, it made uh, common cause with animals. Uh, <coughs> pagans can rot just the way animals can. And I think Shakespeare admired, in the sense, what Christian culture had done to civilize love uh, uh, and to give it some larger spiritual dimension. And, you know, that's what he does in Romeo and Juliet. That's what he does in so many uh, of his uh, love poems. Uh, I think that he really so, so saw this uh, as a key element in civilizing uh, and in something that the Christian Middle Ages had introduced. The love poetry of the Christian Middle Ages is unlike anything before it. Uh, uh, 
uh, and it, it's what give, it's what give, has given us this sense of a deep inner spirituality involved in love. And in this sense, it has become universal uh, because we now have other cultures around the globe that have adopted this same view of love. Uh, and it's a very attractive view. It, it, it means that love has this higher meaning to it. And, it, uh, and you know, it's associated with chivalry. Chivalry was a very civilizing force. It took something as brutal as warfare and tried to give it a higher dimension. Uh, and uh, so it, there's a complete fusion between the courtly love idea and the chivalry idea. So there are ideas of chivalry come from the stories of King Arthur and those stories in body, especially in the figures of Lancelot and Guine Guinevere, the, uh, uh, this higher dimension. Love. So, the, for example, one of the uh, uh, one of the absolutely key texts in this is a book called Lancelot or the Knight of the Card by Chrétien de Troyes, uh, and I think this is written around 1180. It's 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 a poem, uh, but it's a, it's a narrative poem, uh, and it's really the beginning of the Arthurian tradition as we know it. There were stories of Arthur before, but they dealt with warfare and not with love. It's this guy, Chrétien de Troyes, who uh, introduces this new spiritualized notion of love. And uh, there's one po point uh, where uh, uh, Lancelot basically says to Guinevere, what can you what can I do for you? How can I prove my love for you? And she says, there's a tournament tomorrow. Lose. I want you to lose. And you know, Lancelot's the greatest knight. He's uh, undefeated in 57 uh, combat. To, and lose? If, if you really love me, you'll lose. Hmm. Uh, and that show, you know, you'll suffer for me. You will suffer in a deeper sense. You will sacrifice your honor. And Lancelot goes out the next day and he loses to everybody. Like he almost loses to his squire. You know, and every, what's happened to Lancelot? You know, imagine the TV commentators on it. You know, one upset after another. Mm -hmm. Lancelot's supposed to beat every, uh, uh, But here he is, the big loser to prove something to his love and to suffer. So Shakespeare wants to get beyond that, or yes, because there's something uh, potentially. Well, somehow different. recognizing it too, though. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, no, and and again, he certainly makes it a big point uh, of his plays, and no one has ever given a better portrayal of it uh, than Shakespeare does in Romeo and Juliet. But I mean, could you argue that if you put together Romeo and Juliet and uh, Much Ado, or if you some this would be true of some of the other plays, I'd say as well, you maybe have a way he tries to preserve. You're yes. not going to get rid of a kind of romantic love at this point. Maybe you Absolutely. never would have. Yeah, no, and you yeah, somehow yeah, preserve yeah. it, but also civilize it, as it were, or tame it's it, or something like that. Hegelian. We have to alphabet it. it. <laughs> we have to destroy it and preserve it and lift it to a higher level, if, if you know what alphabet means in Hegel. Uh, but it, indeed, ultimately, Shakespeare's goal is to retain the spirituality but get rid of this otherworldliness of it, which makes it so self-defeating. Uh, uh, now, just to heighten the stakes here, uh, uh, this movement begins in France, uh, but uh, Southern France is very close to Northwest Italy. And so it makes it, and of course there's no France, there's no Italy, there's no border at the time. Uh, so this very quickly gets into Italy and leads to a man named Dante. Uh, and as Dante says, his teachers were the uh, troubadours. In fact, in the Divine Comedy, there's one uh, uh, passage that is in Provençal, not in French, not in Italian, but in that weird language, Provençal, uh, uh, which they, they still speak in places like Toulouse in France, this language that's in between French and Italian, uh, he incorporates one as a tribute to the troubadour poets. He includes a passage uh, in Provençal in the Divine Comedy. And of course, what Dante does is to lift this to a whole nother level of spirituality. Uh, first in his uh, love poems, uh, a uh, cycle called La Vita Nuova, uh, The New Life. Uh, Dante is the first to write sonnets in our sense of sonnet, love sonnets. And then, of course, it culminates in the figure of Beatrice, 
uh, in uh, the Divine Comedy, uh, who leads Dante uh, ultimately to paradise and becomes his spiritual guide in paradise. And in Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, there is a woman named Beatrice. Yeah, let's talk. I've always wondered about that. Is that, yeah, I take it that's yeah. not an accident, as we say. No, and she's paired with a man named uh, Benedict, who would be St. Benedict, the founder of monastic orders. Uh, I think that it, that's one of the things that's going on in Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, it's examining uh, the, if you will, the, the spiritual heritage of, uh, uh, of poetry. Uh, and so Shakespeare was very suspicious of this heritage. Uh, uh, it, it becomes uh, uh, the heritage of losers and self-defeatists uh, and is suicidal in the sense that it's based on a notion of this world being thoroughly corrupt and, uh, and incapable of satisfying spiritual desires and leading people into another world. Uh, uh, this is where Derougement is so interesting because he uncovers the Gnostic roots of this. Gnostic, the Gnosticism, the most otherworldly form of Christianity. Right. So uh, uh, well, so the extreme he, for our form. Yeah, of, yeah. yeah. And in a way, uh, I mean, Shakespeare would not have used his vocabulary, but I think his point was this view of love is Gnostic. Uh, it, it, it's based on a thoroughgoing devaluation of this world. Hence, no interest in families and children no interest in prolonging the life in this world. And for Shakespeare, that's the ultimate natural goal of love. Uh, it's nice that it's spiritualized uh, and it can be uh, spiritualized through marriage. And that's how to integrate this natural function uh, into a social function. Uh, but he's very suspicious of this view of love, which again is mystifyingly attractive. Right. But it uh, seems like he also, I mean, I guess one could really go through the different comedies. I never really thought of this before and find different ways in which he shows you how you could resolve, work out the pairings and the matchings of lovers uh, from the point of view of uh, what's good for them, but also what's good for the city for the, and for the yeah. public order. And I mean, they all have this reshuffling at the end and people, you know, yeah. get married uh, off. And I think some of the critics, I always been struck by this. So say a word about this. Some of the critics don't like some of the endings because people kind of get matched up in ways that seem a little unfair sometimes to one or the other. Right. I mean, they kind yeah. of people measure for measure, for example, you know, sort of good people get stuck with some guy who was a creep, just an act before and was, you know, had no, didn't, didn't show much love for her, even in the same act sometimes in act five. Yeah. And I guess that Shakespeare saying, you know, we, you're not always going to have the perfect exactly. match here, but from your point of view, and I guess the city's point of view, yes. you need to in kind of make some accommodations, right? And exactly. Now that's the spirit of Shakespearean comedy is make some accommodations. The spirit of Shakespearean tragedy is no accommodations. Hmm. And once you can realize that, you realize what's going on here. Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream is a perfect example of this. Uh, that you have these four lovers, and it's of a Hermia and Helena and Demetrius and Lysander. And don't ask me to pair them up the way they are at the beginning of the play. Mm -hmm. But the point is that uh, uh, each one thinks there's only this one woman for me, and through this magic love juice, Hermia and uh, uh, Lysander and Demetrius both end up uh, in love with Hermia, I think it is. And and as they say in the notes, confusion follows, <laughs> chaos follows. Uh, these lovers are so obsessed. There's only one woman for me. And remember, this Shakespeare showed Romeo and Juliet. Uh, but on the, one day it was Rosalind. Yeah, Rosalind yeah, is the most perfect woman on earth. It's Rosalind, Rosalind, or death. And then he sees Juliet. <laughs> And suddenly Juliet's the only woman for him, and it's Juliet or death. And unfortunately, he dies before he can meet another woman and move on. Uh, uh, and so, for example, in Midsummer Night's Dreams, uh, these lovers get so confused, so totally disoriented, and it's leading. Uh, Lysander's trying to kill uh, Demetrius, and, uh, uh, and then. Uh, the fairies restore order by using this magic love juice to get them lined up, uh, not properly, 
properly, but just so there could be some resolution at, at all. And the lovers wake up from this, and they they say, "I I uh, gee, I thought I loved you, and you love me." And they're so confused. Uh, and and then they say. Uh, this is good. Let's just settle for this. And the point, they were on the road to death. Don't you think sometimes it seems like in the comedies, they're not perfectly, but there's a little bit of appropriateness Oh yes. in the, yeah, in the way yeah. people get matched up. The, the, the better characters, the Duke and Measure for Measure, get the better women. No, so, no, that is true. So, so there's yeah. kind of a way in which it, it, it shows you how to work these things out a little bit too, maybe. You know? Yeah, like, but you always got to give up the desire yeah. for the perfect woman. Yeah. Uh, again, in much to do about nothing. Uh, the, uh, 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 Beatrice is trying to figure. Oh, I'd like, I'd like the happy medium between these two men. And 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 at one point, uh, let's see, Claudio comes in with a bill of particulars what the perfect woman would have. And you know, that's no way to live a human life. Uh, and and so, uh, as I like to put it. In tragedy, the principle is accept no substitutes. That's a, you are going to live or die to get Juliet. Uh, but the whole principle for Shakespeare comedy is accept substitutes. That's what human life is. Uh, yes, human beings are different, but they're not categorically different from each other. There's not just one single perfect woman for you. And again, that's well. And whole, also, you wouldn't necessarily be correct. In your initial love, love, you know, right. seventeen you, year old falling in love judgment of yeah. which is perfect for you, right? Because people end up in better matches sometimes yeah. yes. by the end. Another you know. deep convention of this notion of love is love at first sight. Right, which he does. Dante is sees Beatrice when she's eight years old. I forget how old Laura was when Petrarch first saw, her, but. Uh, to this Shakespeare saw the absurdity of this. And now, Romeo and Juliet, he takes it seriously. When Romeo and Juliet meet, and they meet in a sonnet, by the way, <laughs> to show that they're dominated by a, a, a poetic tradition, uh, they fall in love at first sight. And it seems Shakespeare makes it so convincing. Uh, uh, but then he shows in Midsummer Night's Dream uh, that uh, Falling in love at first sight is the equivalent of having taken a love potion. Yeah. And remember how important a love potion is in the Tristan and his oldest story. Uh, and if you're founding your notion of love on the notion of love at first sight, how accurate is that going to be? And uh, the action in Shakespeare's comedies is very often to give the lovers a chance to get to know each other before they get married. Uh, 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 and it usually takes the form, and this is getting very interesting about Shakespeare and comedy, uh, uh, the woman, for one reason or another, has to disguise herself as a man. Uh, it happens in As You Like It with Rosalind. Uh, it happens uh, with uh, uh, Portia in The Merchant of Venice. It happens again and again in Shakespeare and comedy. And I think the reason for that is Shakespeare uh, is trying to remake love on the model of friendship. Hmm. His basic point is that uh, we get our models of love from literature. Uh, this, I think, is why he may have felt responsible in this situation. Uh, you know, today we'd say, where do young people get their idea of romance? It's from movies and television. I mean, that's where they see it. And whether they want to or not, they grow up imitating that. And Shakespeare saw that this was happening in his day where the models uh, of love were coming out of literature. In Romeo and Juliet, when uh, Mercutio starts hearing Romeo speak about Juliet, he says, now is he for the numbers that Petrarch flowed in. Hmm. Amazing. I mean, obviously Shakespeare knows this, but Mercutio knows, hey, this is just coming from an Italian poet. Right, this is coming from Petrarch. Yeah. And that's Shakespeare's concern, uh, almost as a professional. If it's, what in the world are we do, poets doing to humanity? Uh, we're, we're feeding whole generations on an absurd notion of love, uh, which is self-destructive and destructive, which is avowedly hostile to normal social function that in a way teaches kids to rebel against their parents 
merely for the sake of rebelling against their parents. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think he set out uh, to uh, demolish this whole world of courtly love. And by the way, it is very interesting that Miguel Cervantes at almost the exact same time was doing the exact same thing. Right. I think if you want to understand what's going on in Shakespeare's comedies, the best analog is Cervantes Don Quixote, uh, where he takes the same world of courtly love. He shows in Don Quixote a man who's gone mad reading books. And one of the books, they're the tales of chivalry. And this is quite explicit, Caballer. Caballeria, it is in the Spanish. Uh, uh, the Don Quixote is explicitly an attack on books of chivalry, uh, and for just the same reasons uh, that it's impractical, uh, it doesn't take into account uh, the normal functions of human life, uh, and it's profoundly associated with Christianity and the work as well. Uh, in that uh, Don Quixote, he keeps calling himself the most Christian. Uh, of nights. I find it really fascinating that uh, uh, Shakespeare and Cervantes, uh, who died on the exact same date, yeah, so they really, <laughs> they, they really are they really are contemporaries. Uh, and you know, it's fascinating. Shakespeare knew Don Quixote. Uh, evidently, he wrote a play based on an episode of Don Quixote. It's called Cardenio. It's lost, unfortunately. That the greatest loss in the history of literature. Yeah, that's terrible. Oh <laughs> yeah. man, you should we, find it. I mean, that would be well, a big. You know, that would be so, a genuine it, contribution you know it's a very complicated situation because people think it was rewritten by an 18th century uh playwright who had access to the manuscript which was subsequently burned anyway it's like a whole mystery story even on, on cardinio there's been a play written about the writing of it anyway uh but I think you really see the convergence of, I would say, the two greatest writers of the age, Shakespeare and Cervantes, both on this point that in this regard, the medieval heritage of Europe was really dangerous. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, and again, it's so attractive to young people to think that love is taking them to heaven, uh, uh, that... Uh, that's giving them a deeper spirituality. And in some sense it does, but it can get out of hand when love becomes the sole value and you do everything in the name of love, as of course happens with Don Quixote uh, in, in Cervantes' uh, novel as well. Uh, Your account of Summit Night's Dream reminds me of my favorite uh Composer, I think Wagner might be yours, but, uh, but most, my favorite well, composer is Bach. I do oh, not Bach. want. Oh my God! Like, Come okay, on. Bach is the greatest. Composer. No, well, Bach is more intellectual, but Mozart, who is really the greatest composer, uh, Cosi Fan Tutte. When you think about the plot, is very much like Midsummer Night's Dream. These two people who are in a silly, childish way had think they're headlong in heels in love with these women, and I think the women are in love with them, and then the philosopher Don Alfonso shows them it could just as easily be reversed once they show up in disguises. I wonder how much Devante must have known, I bet, Shakespeare. There's no reason oh, yes. he wouldn't have. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, and I, you know, and it's obviously you don't have to have that particular uh, uh, play in mind, but, but the Cosi Van Tutti, I'd say, is famously almost nihilistic and it's kind of total contempt for that kind of uh, love at first sight and, and, and the kind of uh, cynicism with which it ends, where it's unclear which one should be paired with, with the other and so forth. Whereas what, I do come back to the fact that Shakespeare seems to want to give more of a, uh, a an out that's not just, you know, let's just be cynical and hard headed about the way things are. I mean, there's a lot of that, but that the, he wants to give people a sense of how this can be resolved in a way that's in accord with actual ha human happiness yeah. and, I mean, and in, so in forth. In Shakespeare's last play, uh, The Tempest, uh, this wise man, Prospero, yeah, guides his daughter into marriage with a young man, uh, but they must overcome their Gnostic tendencies. Yeah, that's interesting, <laughs> right? So they, uh, there's a kind uh, of happy, yeah, yeah well, happy yeah, ending, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, but supervised. This is moment where Prospero talks to Ferdinand, you know, and he, he, he tells, no carpe diem thoughts, no season day thoughts. You can have plenty of time and have long life. I don't want you in bed with her tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, just a brilliant moment where she Shakespeare, so much of this is an uh, attitude of tamp it down, 
moderate it. This is just getting out of hand. You're going to kill yourselves if you keep it at this at this pace. Let me make one quick comment on, on what you said about Mozart. The place where this love tradition lasted longest was an opera. Uh, right. And it goes all the way through to Wagner. But where, Mozart was hostile to it, if you yes, think about it. Well, that's right. But, and all but, of them, Figaro, I mean, you yeah, know. But you the know. reason why you're taking examples from opera, and it's very uh, apt that you do, is that this is where this view of love maintained that's, itself. Yeah, I see what and you so mean. And so people yeah. had to keep, in some ways, Richard Strauss comes back to this uh, uh, in Rosen Cavalier and in Ariadne. And, and doesn't Cons- Beethoven write Fidelio as a rebuke to Cosi Fan Tutte? Oh, because yes, because marriage. Beethoven, because it shows marriage as the highest thing and yes, fide- yes, fidelity. Yes, yeah, yeah. And he hates uh, the fact that Mozart uh, is so, I don't know, hard headed, let's just say, about. Yeah, or uh, loose moral. Uh, yeah, well, but but it, it's really, I mean, in a way, this plays itself out in opera. I mean, uh, the uh, very origins of opera. Monteverdi, the Orfeo and Euridice. Yeah, well, that's right. That's uh, yeah, good, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 De Rougemont's book is very good on this because he takes it up to the 20th century. Is that right? I will look, I will look at yeah. that. That's good. Uh, Say a word about um, comedy and tragedy. So Shakespeare wrote these comedies. He wrote these extremely famous tragedies. Uh, the relationship of the two in general and the fact yeah. that he was able to write both and so forth. Okay, I'll, I'll take another cue from Strauss here. Uh, I think I've got the right passage. I, I think it is from Socrates uh, uh, and Aristotle, Aristophanes. Uh, let's see if I can find differently stated, uh, uh, differently stated, comedy can achieve this work since it surpasses tragedy only by presupposing it, as is shown most simply by the parodic use that it makes of tragedy. And uh, of course, Strauss is right that there are all these passages from Aeschylus and Euripides that are parodied in uh, Aristophanes' comedies uh, and uh, uh, Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream is a parody of Romeo and Juliet. But Shakespeare uh, wrote both, whereas Aristophanes wrote the comedies and no, Aeschylus I mean, wrote the well, tragedies, that, right? That is the amazing thing about Shakespeare that's always worth noting. Uh, he's pretty much the only person who was as good at comedy as he was at tragedy. He had such a universal perspective that he could write both. You know, if you go back to the ancient world, you got tragedians like Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles, and then you got the comic writers uh, like Aristophanes. Uh, But it's very rare to find someone like Shakespeare. For example, among his contemporaries, Thomas Middleton, actually was very good at both comedy and tragedy, but not as good at, uh, at either as Shakespeare was, and hence nobody remembers Thomas Middleton, except English professors uh, like me. Or Sh- you know, he's the greatest tragedy writer. He's also the greatest comedy writer ever, uh, and not just in the sense, this philosophical sense of comedy, but funny. He wrote yeah. really, really funny plays, and in uh, many ways invented uh, comic situations that we have uh, to this day. So uh, here's a good way of formulating the difference. The, 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 this, I'm trying to invoke as many literary critics as I can to give a, a, a stay in, but philosophers are usually the people who uh, reflect the best on comedy tragedy. So Jose Ortega y Gasset, uh, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, very famous in the first half of the 20th century, I don't think he's heard of it anymore at all. I don't know, I'm just old enough to have like, he was famous, declining, just, but still famous, yeah, you know, yeah. when I was in high school he and was, college. Revolt yeah, of he, the Masses is the one book yeah, we, all, we all read. Revolt of the Masses, but another essay, The Dehumanization of Anyway, he wrote a book called Meditations on Quixote, uh, which uh, uh, contains a section called A Short Treatise on the Novel. It's the most brilliant thing I've ever seen on the uh, genre of the novel, but uh, he defines uh, going into the novel, he, he goes through the history of literature, and he's talking about tragedy and comedy, and he def- defines the difference between them this way, uh, that tragedy is about people who strive to be gods and fail, whereas comedy is about people who already think they are gods. And so uh, I think you can see that relationship in uh, Romeo and Juliet and uh, 
Mr. Ice Cream. Romeo and Juliet is about uh, two young lovers who think they've achieved something divine. And you can definitely see that uh, in their language and who constantly say, if I don't have you, I have nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, in that sense, death is their only response to their loss of each other because then they would be without nothing. So in some ways they're trying to be love gods uh, and fail and that's tragic. Whereas in Midsummer Night's Dream, you have these characters who puff themselves up thinking their love is divine uh, and that they're the great models of love. And of course they aren't as shown by the fact that when push comes to shove, they'll accept the next, the next person that's in bed with them. Uh, uh, very often, you can compare Shakespeare's comedies to a game of musical chairs. Uh, and people have to switch partners and dance around. And in the end, when the music stops, whomever they're paired with, that's who you marry. And you just accept it. Like in, uh, in, in Much Ado About Nothing, uh, where Claudio thinks he's lost hero. Uh, right. He was too demanding of her. Uh, she has died after he insulted her at their wedding died of shame uh, and he's told well okay you know that's over done with uh, his prince tells him uh, there's someone I want you to marry but you got to marry her unseen <laughs> it's the very opposite of love at first sight <laughs> mm -hmm. love at first sight in a way is so irrational but Claudia goes okay I'll marry her well, now, of course it turns out to be hero she didn't really die she's and resurrected so, uh, you might yeah, say yeah, yeah. Yeah. oh yes yes <laughs> like for Biney, uh in uh, uh, Winter's Tale. Uh, but uh, uh, it's that sense of just, uh, he, he's in such despair. He's so confused that, okay, I'll take anything. And in a way, that's the attitude you have to take, that it's more important that you make the marriage work, <laughs> that you're committed to it, than that you found the absolutely perfect uh, uh, woman there. So anyway, uh, in that sense, uh, Shakespeare, you take Romeo and Juliet and A Minister's Dream, they have the exact same subject, uh, uh, romantic love and romantic love against the parents' wishes and all of that. And one ends tragically and one ends comically. Yeah. And Romeo and Juliet ends tragically because the characters will accept no substitutes in the uh, a Midsummer's Dream, uh, they, uh, it ends uh, comically because they will accept substitutes. Now, why is substitution the issue here? The question is whether human beings are unique or not. Uh, tragedy deals with a world of unique individuals where there really is only one woman for you or one man for you, and anything short of that is unacceptable. Uh, Comedy deals, and even with, the political tragedies deal with extraordinary individuals. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, what we're getting. Macbeth, what we're getting, Kingly, right. That what we're getting at here is that Shakespeare's tragedies deal with extraordinary individuals in their extraordinariness. His comedy deals with ordinary individuals in their ordinariness. And I think Shakespeare was able to move between comedy and tragedy. And by the way not just from play to play, but within plays with the famous comic relief in his tragedies and what I call the tragic relief in his comedies. Uh, you know, when Hero dies, uh, much ado about nothing. That looks pretty tragic to us. That could have been a tragedy. When yeah. you watch Much of you, I happened to go to Much ado about nothing a couple of years ago. It could be a tragedy, oh, just, just like Romeo just, and Juliet could have been a comedy. Been comedy. Yeah, that's right. exact. And, and what it turns on is whether we're dealing with human beings in their extraordinariness and therefore their ultimate individuality or in their ordinariness and their uh, substitutability. Uh, and Shakespeare has a sense for both. And yes. I think that's what uh, that is uh, most, uh, most playwrights or authors, uh, they either looking at people in their extraordinariness or in their ordinariness. And Shakespeare can, can see both. And of course, the, the point about tragedy and why Shakespeare is such a great tragedian is he can see what nobility is. He can look at these figures like King Lear and Marcus Brutus and Coriolanus uh, and, and Othello and say, what extraordinary noble people these are. Uh, 
but that means they're willing to die yeah. for what they you believe. See, it's the other side of things too. And I is I'll, I'll maybe I'll close with this question, which occurred to me because I was looking at what you do about nothing when you a couple of a few months ago you gave a lecture on it, which I happened to see, and I so I looked at the play for a few minutes, and the play begins Leonardo begins. I learn in this letter, and I thought that's interesting to begin. I have no deep thoughts about this. I just noted this that it begins with the words "I learn," which is kind of uh, interesting if you sort of assume that Shakespeare might be saying something about that. Then I thought, is it fair to say that in the comedies, the characters, at least some of them, learn something? They 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 do change. I mean, they 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 learn something about life and about themselves and about love, maybe uh, in the course of the comedies. Whereas I guess in the tragedies, maybe I'm wrong about this, but in the tragedies, they don't really people don't learn much. I guess King Lear maybe does, but, you know, mostly they just kind of are themselves and they're amazing, interesting characters, right? And they do their thing and it ends in blood and death and all that. Do you think it's something to that, that comedies are more educational than tragedies for the, that you see an education going on in a sense in the comedies a little differently uh, from in the tragedies? Well, you know, there's a principle in the Greek tragedy uh, you see in Aeschylus' Oresteia to learn through suffering. So I think, and obviously King Lear is that someone. The, yeah. I, the difference is whether you can put the learning to work. And the, the tragedies uh, happen too late. That's say. interesting. So they both uh, learn. It's just that a different, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you learn uh, too late, right? You learn too late. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a leopard can't change its spots. You can't teach old dogs new tricks. Uh, uh, now, as I uh, as I see it, another way I formulate the difference uh, is I look at what's a virtue and what's a vice in comedy and tragedy. Uh, in tragedy, uh, the great virtue is integrity. Uh, it's I stand by my principles. I will die for that. And the great vice is pliancy. Uh, it's compromise, it's giving in, uh, it's not standing by your principles. It is fascinating to see how that gets reversed in comedy. What's the virtue of integrity in tragedy becomes the vice of stubbornness in comedy. And what is pliancy in tragedy becomes flexibility or adaptability in comedy. Tragic heroes precisely won't change. And they learn but in a way they learn too late uh, and when they can change. And so they learn just before they go to their deaths because they're loyal to their principles. Comic characters change. Uh, the spirit of Shakespeare and comedy is very much the spirit of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Mm -hmm. You know, Ovid's Metamorphoses was one of Shakespeare's favorite books. And you see it all over his comedies, above all uh, in Midsummer Night's Dream, but in uh, uh, Much Ado as well. Uh, comedy is the world of transformation, Shakespeare. Uh, uh, tragic characters break, comic characters bend. Uh, and, you know, it's it's very easy to see the ignobility of Shakespeare's comic figures. It's what you were referring to when you feel bad when, let's say, the woman ends up without the perfect man. Uh, but there's a sense in which that's the virtue of human life. Yeah. Moving on. Shakespeare's tragic figures can't move on. His comic figures do move on. Uh, and in a way, it's accepting second best. Uh, uh, and, and so, again, that's how he can get so easily from tragedy to comedy. Uh, uh, and one way, you know, uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet is tragic. Hermia and Helena and Lysander and Demetrius is comedy. Right. Because now, uh, two lovers, there's no way to resolve it. But four, okay, we'll just switch them around. Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. That, that should be comedy for Shakespeare. Uh, uh, and it's fascinating that very often he creates comedy just by doubling. And he learned that trick as early as Comedy of Errors, mm. where everything depends upon these identical twins. Mm. Identical twins freak us out because they go against our notion that we each have a unique identity. Wait a minute, there's two of them. So they're uh, useful from a comic point of view. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and very often you will find comedy uh, will just double things. Uh, I, re I remember 
back in our Harvard days, uh, the Hasty Pudding shows, a friend of mine was writing one of them, uh, and he took King Lear, uh, and he had just had two King Lears come out of the, you know, the entire we shall express our darker purpose, the entire we shall express our darker purpose, purpose. and that mere doubling of yeah. having two King Lears on stage at once made it into a farce. Uh, uh, and so again, Shakespeare is so fantastic, but, but you know, he, his movement from tragedy to comedy reflects his ability to move from the extraordinariness of human beings to the ordinariness of human beings. I mean, he had the most extraordinary sense of human extraordinariness. extraordinariness. Right. I mean, he created this gallery of heroes. Uh, they're just so much larger than life and so noble. But he also had a tremendous sense of ordinariness. Right. And why, you know, that's part of human life. So in Much Ado About Nothing, we have this fabulous character, Dogberry, uh, uh, one of Shakespeare's great, great uh, 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 comic inventions. He would have been played by Will Kemp, uh, the same comedian who created the role of Falstaff. And uh, uh, Dogberry is the constable in Messina in Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, and he's in charge of the watch and giving them their instructions. And uh, one of his officers says, well, what if we find someone drinking late night on the streets? And he says, uh, ask him not to drink. He said, but what if he keeps on drinking? He says, well, then pass him by, leave him alone. So you don't want to wake people up late at night. And, uh, uh, and, and besides, we're supposed to police the, uh, the Duke's subjects. Uh, if he's drinking late at night, he's not really one of the Duke's subjects. So you can ignore him. So it's this incredibly passive police force uh, which cannot enforce any rules and which Dover is a very ordinary character perfect example of a comic character in Shakespeare. And so he can't bring himself uh, to enforce rules on other people. Moreover, uh, uh, he has no sense of pride. Uh, someone uh, is arguing with someone and someone says, to him, uh, you're tedious, Dogberry, you're tedious. Says, oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I was trying very hard to be tedious. Uh, and then someone calls him an ass. Uh, the <laughs> rest of the place, be sure you write me down an ass. He wants to make sure that this guy's uh, act of Les Majesté has been recorded. Be sure you write me down as. But for the rest of the play, he's very related to Nick Bottom and Mr. Right Stream in that sense, who transformed an ass. Uh, but the nice thing about him is he never provoke any problems to the community. Uh, yeah. So many of Shakespeare's problematic characters are busybodies yeah. and trying to enforce rules. On other, uh, and so in the irony of this comedy, uh, it's Dogberry who hears Don John's plot uh, against uh, Claudio and, and Hero. Uh, and, and so he actually breaks up uh, the main nefarious plot in the play uh, and when this is being explained to the uh, the, the Duke in several the city, uh, the character who's named Baraccio, which, which means the drunkard, uh, uh, says, uh, 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 what your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools have brought to light. And it is the yeah, joke good. of the that's play good. that yeah. the, all the great rulers all the people who run the world, uh, their wisdom is foolishness. And it's the shallow fools uh, that resolve the problem. Uh, what your wisdoms could not discover. Yeah, that is a, they need, uh, a and, touch, need a touch of dogberry, right? Uh, uh, now, and yeah. again, this, the, the, to get back to the very beginning. Yeah, yeah let's finish up here. Yeah, what, right. What's very philosophical about Shakespeare is this, uh, that... Uh, the wisdom of the world is foolishness. Now that's a religious principle, but Shakespeare carries on. It's in the tradition of Erasmus's praise of folly. It's very much in the tradition of Socrates choosing his examples uh, from uh, uh, very common people, shoemakers and, and so on. Uh, and so in, in that sense, uh, it's uh, the, uh, Shakespeare's sense of human ordinariness is a sense of human nature, and it really is getting uh, to understand 
the natural as opposed to the conventional. I could show that in so many ways, clear in his tragedies, but in the comedies, it comes down to this point uh, that people have become captive of phony conventions uh, in love. They're just reading Dante, they're reading Petrarch. Uh, and by the way, you know, uh, there was a huge sonnet, vogue of sonnet writing in the 1580s uh, in Elizabethan England. And people are getting their ideas from books. That's convention. And you just got to get back to the natural in love. And love is based in sexual attraction. In that sense, it's very much in human nature. Uh, uh, but as you you don't just leave it uh, uh, in the absence of any kind of social control. You can put it this way, that uh, Shakespeare is a very complex understanding of the relation of nature uh, and, and convention, which I think is very similar uh, to Plato's. It, it, it's this, that uh, 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 yes, nature and convention get out of whack. It's definitely characteristic of human societies that they fall into conventional habits. Over time, uh, convention uh, drifts too far from nature. Uh, you know, it's, it, it is natural for human beings to sing about love. I mean, birds do it, bees do it. Uh, 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 and, and Shakespeare understands it's, it's natural that we get poetic about this very powerful sexual feeling, but sometimes it just gets out of hand. And so for Shakespeare, the program is always bring convention more in harmony with nature. I don't think he ever believed for a moment that there would not be a gap between nature and convention, that convention could ever become purely nature. But you can still evaluate conventions uh, insofar as they are further or closer from nature. And I think his whole poetic project in the comedies was to bring our love conventions more in harmony with nature. So that, again, he doesn't want purely animal sexuality. He does want marriage, which is something conventional. He does think that love must be built into the conventions of a community. But again, there, there's different conventions. Right. And Shakespeare never just says, uh, 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 forget all conventions are equal. In fact, he's always evaluating them uh, uh, whether they're closer uh, to uh, to nature or not. Uh, and so, his great project in these comedies is to look at love and say, how could it be more natural? Right. And the way you don't want it to be perfectly natural, you want it to fit into the city, the community. In that sense, it has to have uh, an ele element of convention. I think this is ultimately the teaching of King Lear as well. But uh, in, in some ways, it's clearer uh, in these uh, comedies. And again, that would make the comedies uh, very, very philosophical. That's a good uh, a good note to end on. We have to come back and do King Lear one of these days, but to say we still I, haven't done King Lear. We no, really and I find that it's such a mystifying play, but I, we'll do that someday. But um, it's more to say about the comedies too. But let's let's end with that. This has been a very stimulating conversation, not just about Shakespeare, but about comedy and tragedy and uh, literary uh, other literary matters and uh, philosophic matters, really. But uh, I will say that young lovers who are watching this should direct their, they should write us at Conversations with Bill Crystal and I'll forward all of your extremely angry and annoyed and intemperate objections to Paul, to Paul Cantor himself. And he'll, you'll have to answer each one of them when these young lovers write in saying that you're being much too disrespectful of their unique love for their unique uh, first, uh, you know, love at first sight uh, object oh, of their love. I'm only trying to save their lives. You can explain that to them when they email, when they uh, in your in your email response. Paul Cantor, thank you for joining me on this very interesting conversation, uh, and thank you for joining us on conversations.